Well, good morning. It is uh, good to be with you. It's Thursday night here, but Sunday morning for you. And uh, while I'm, like many of you, disappointed that we can't all be together, I am very much encouraged that we can still gather around together under the Word of God, which is why we meet on Sunday mornings anyways, to, to hear from God's Word. And um, we will still do that today. And uh, I also just want to encourage you that uh, even though we're practicing this social distancing, uh, there is no such thing of social distance with Christ, that with Him we can come near all the time. Whether you're healthy or sick, whether you're young or old, we can all draw near to the Lord, and we need to keep that on the forefront of our minds, especially during this time. And last week, Pastor Mike mentioned that encouraged us to go through the Psalms, and had already been going through the Psalms, and so I thought it was good and appropriate that I would just go there this morning. And so I want to invite you, even at home, to open your Bibles with me and turn to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1 is where we're going to be, and as you're turning there, I just have to admit, I have to confess that the Psalms, they, they do hold a special place inside of my heart, uh, mainly because they help me realize that the struggles that I go through in the faith are not really unique. In the Psalms, what you see is authentic faith that is expressed in very beautiful ways. It was John Calvin who said that the Psalms are the anatomy of all the parts of the soul. And he's absolutely right. They, they are. They're like x-rays that expose what's inside. And in the Psalms, what you see is, is moments of great faith and also moments of doubt. You see times of great courage and times of fear. You see times of victory and also times of defeat. You see moments of great and deep theological understanding, and you also see times of confusion. You see what real nitty-gritty faith looks like as it's lived out before God. And I trust that this morning as we turn to the Psalms, well, our hearts will be encouraged and our wills will be challenged as we look at Psalm chapter 1. So let me begin this morning by reading for you Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yield its fruits in season, and its leaves do not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so but are like shaft that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. It was Friedrich Nietzsche, the 19th century German philosopher who once famously wrote these words, you have your way, I have my way. As for the right way, the only way, the correct way. It does not exist. Well, we know that, of course, that that statement is diametrically opposed to a biblical worldview. But I do believe it rightly summarizes the perspective that is resident in much of our culture today. That statement is simply the fruit of what we call moral relativism, which teaches that there is no such thing as objective truth. That truth as a reality can only exist in relationship to the culture that it finds itself. That truth is not actually set firm in reality, but is instead circumstantial. That there's not actually a right way or a wrong way outside of individual belief. In our current day where pluralism reigns in the culture, I think there's as much scornful hostility toward the idea of one God and one truth as there was in Nietzsche's writings. There is, I think, a, a deep animosity toward any sort of claim of exclusivity. To say that there is one God is almost repulsive to the relativist. To say that, there, that God has not revealed himself through a plurality of avatars is uh, almost unbearable to them. According to pluralist thinking, relativist thinking, there, there just can't be one way to God. There, there must be many ways to him. But you and I both know that if I were to say anything else than that, that there is only one way to God, then I would have nothing to preach because the Bible knows nothing of such thinking. And the exclusive claims of Christianity in terms of God, in terms of Christ, in terms of salvation, they really can't live in peaceful coexistence with relativist thinking. The worldview of pluralism, the, their, their chief virtue is tolerance. 
which is the notion that all religious views and all belief systems are equal and must be tolerated as the same. And in fact, the only thing that cannot be tolerated is the claim of exclusivity, which ironically is very intolerant of them. And so this system of thought, which dominates the culture, it really does fail for so many reasons, not the least of which, but we should never tolerate evil. It is unloving to tolerate evil. Secondly, it is in and of itself self-defeating because to say that there are no absolutes, you yourself make an absolute claim. But the issue really at hand has nothing to do with an intellectual hurdle. It has everything to do with a moral one. Because at the very core, they believe that people are somehow free in and of themselves to invent truth. It has to do with autonomy. But the reality is we do not invent truth. We discover truth because we are not the creators. God is. And so he is the creator. We are the recipients. And there is a summary statement that we must all come to grips with if we're going to rightly understand Psalm 1, and in fact, all the psalm and all of the scriptures, and that is that you and I live in a moral world. That truth as a category does, in fact, exist. Like it or not, this is a world of right and wrong, of good and evil, of true and false. And Psalm 1 shows us that there is... No place in our life where we can hide from that reality. The psalm, you'll notice, does not open with a plurality of people. It introduces us only to two types of people. Two people on two different paths, living two different lives, heading to two different destinies. And these are two contrasting ideas. We see one person is blessed and we see one is cursed. One is like a tree and one is like the shaft. One is fruitful and the other is barren. And these are the two types of people who are present in today's world. And in all of the world, there are not multiple types of people. There are only two. God only sees two. Of course, we see all sorts of different types of people. We see rich, we see poor, we see Republican, we see Democrat, we see Americans and we see foreigners, and the list can go on and on and on. But that, that, that is not how it is through the lens of Psalm 1. That is not how it is through the lens of God. There are only two, the saved and the unsaved, the righteous and the unrighteous. And what this psalm reminds us of is that, that there is a right way that we can be blessed by God, and there is a devastatingly wrong way. And so the first person that we see is the blessed man in verses 1 through 3. Follow along with me, verse 1 says that the blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yield its fruit in season. And its leaves do not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. This psalm opens with a, a benediction. The word blessed is used. And simply the grammar means it implies a plural meaning, which is to say that we can learn of the multitude of blessings that come from those who follow this instruction. And this blessedness is illustrated by giving both a negative and a positive comparison. On one hand, there is a, a negative denial, and on the other hand, there is a positive assertion. And by doing that, it leaves no room for misunderstanding. Those of you that are parents probably understand this because you parent in the same way. You say, on one end, son, daughter, do not do this because this is the consequence. And on the other hand, I want you to do this because these are the blessings as a result. And by doing those two extremes, you leave out any room for misunderstanding. Nothing is changed here with the scriptures. Man's spiritual life is presented before us, both negatively and positively, both inwardly and externally, both figuratively and literally. And it really, I think, drives home like a hammer the truth by the use of contrast. Uh, these repetitions are what we call parallels. And parallels are simply a way of, of making a point and then making it again in a slightly stronger way or slightly different way. And the principle that is driven out is that there are certain things that corrupt, certain things that tear down and destroy, and there are certain things that build up and develop and give the capacity for greater joy and happiness as we walk in relationship with God. And so the first area we look at are the negatives, and they are the things to be avoided. And the scripture says, do not walk with the wicked. 
Do not stand with the sinners and do not sit in the seat of scoffers. And the contrast that is being drawn here is not so much the wicked versus the righteous. It has more to do with illustrating how we are being influenced from one area of life versus being influenced from another area of life. It's about being shaped in our thinking uh, from the wicked versus being shaped from the thinking by the instruction of the Lord. Because nobody walks with the wicked, nobody stands with the sinner, nobody sits with the scoffers out of duty. The truth is we, we walk and we stand and we sit there because we want to. We do it because we want to. Because we have been focusing on the ways of the world. That's in fact how worldliness happens. You just start by looking at the stuff that the world produces and if you look at it long enough and you think about it long enough, you will begin to walk and stand and sit in their councils and their seats. One Puritan writer put it this way, when the tenor of one's life is wicked, it is because they are, in fact, wicked. Now, I would say that's a fairly challenging statement, but I also think it's true. In other words, when there's nothing to distinguish us in thought pattern or behavior from the world, it is presumably because we are like them. Paying lip service to truth while living a life that is not remarkably different is not the message of Christianity. The difficult thing is not so much in our understanding of this truth. I think the difficulty really lies in its application because it is hard, I understand. It's difficult to, to not succumb to the outside influences of the world. I get it, I, I work like many of you in an, an environment that is for the most part devoid of Christian virtue. I understand how, how hard it is to be surrounded by people who do not share your convictions, who do not share the same virtues as you. And there is tremendous pressure to be just like the world and it's hard to hang out with certain people and to maintain our Christian character. And, and we know what it's like, what it's like to go to lunch or sit down for coffee with these certain people and it's only a matter of time before they're going to make a statement or make a joke. And when they do that, how do you respond? Do you laugh? Do you just pretend like you did not hear it even though they know you heard it? That's awkward. What, how do you respond in these type of situations? And I think part of it, this is what it's addressing. What do we do? Do we just run and isolate ourselves from the culture around us? Do we hide? Well, scripture would inform us, no. Matthew 28, 19 says, go into all the world and make disciples. You cannot make disciples in isolation. So I don't think the answer is to isolate ourselves. I believe the answer is to insulate ourselves, insulate our lives. You see, if we isolate our lives, we will have a message, but we will not have an audience. And the flip side of that is if we live self-absorbed lives, we will have an audience, but we will not have a message. And so the answer is that we are called to engage the wicked with an insulated life that is wrapped up in the goodness and the truth of God's word and the gospel that we bring. And we encounter the wicked by the things that we embrace. And the key for us to engage this culture is to claim verse 2. It's about focus. It's about delight and meditation. Read along, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. John Piper said that just like the pleasures of the world are awakened by looking at them long enough, so the pleasures of the regenerate soul are awoken by looking at the word day and night. You see, the word of God is designed to shape our thinking through meditation and to uh, shape our feelings by becoming our very delight. And this requires a, a biblical focus, and a biblical focus creates almost like a mental map inside of our heads. When I, when I go to sleep and I wake up in the middle of the night, my room is, is pitch black, but I can get out of bed and walk around my room without being able to see and not be a threat to, to stub my toe or bump my knee because I have created a mental map in my head of the layout of the room. And this uh, biblical focus creates almost like a mental map by which we can navigate the world around us. That, that's what a Christian worldview does. It provides a mental map so that we can travel through uh, the dark marketplace of ideas that are in this world without stumbling. And so as Christians, we frame our standard of godliness by the objective truth of God's word. And it is this word that shapes our thinking and it forms our very arguments. As Christians, the key to do this is what verse 2 says, meditating and delighting. 
for the Christian, our, our obedience is birthed outside of our delighting. It's, it's a product of that. We don't, we don't see uh, obeying God as a, as a barrier to fun. We see it as a safeguard that keeps us in his will and introduces us into a life of purity and, and, and integrity. And it is with renewed minds that we look at the world and we, and we see the things that they're doing and we realize, sure, I could do those things, but they will not bring me happiness. Those things aren't going to ultimately bring contentment to my life because those things were not designed to do that. We were made not to lean on our own understanding. We were made to fear God and to listen to his counsel and to let him bring us delight by following him. In fact, you can read all about this in Psalm 19. This is a wonderful account of, of the delight that the word of God brings. Listen to it. Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise, simple, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than honey dripping from the honeycomb. Church, I don't challenge you to invest that verse into your life and, and see the return that God will bring to you. You see here that the blessed person is really the twofold person. In one sense, they avoid the negative things of the world, but in another sense, they delight in God's truth and they meditate on it. I would argue that meditation is probably one of the most neglected Christian disciplines of our day. When I say meditation, I would guess that most Americans think of, of yoga pants in a gym and simply emptying their minds. And I will tell you that that has nothing to do with biblical meditation. That, that is a self-absorbed method. That is an Eastern religion, pantheistic view of meditating. Biblical meditation is simply internalizing the word of God into your life. Meditation is, is very much like digestion is in physical terms. My wife advised me not to use this illustration, but I will. I use it at dinner and uh, she didn't like it because we were eating. But... It's very much the same. Uh, it is possible for us to physically stick food into your mouth and do nothing else with it. And if you do that, if you stick food into your mouth and you do nothing else with it from there, a number of things are very true about you. Number one, you're gross. It's, it's not nice to do that. It's gross. Number two, it will eventually choke you. And if it does not choke you, it will eventually proceed back out of your mouth, which is also gross. And fourthly, it will do nothing for you in terms of nutritional value. And so in the same way, to return back to God's word day after day and Sunday after Sunday and, and, and do nothing with it from there, it's an unbelievably fruitless exercise. And as gross as it may sound, I think we must learn to be uh, more cow-like in our manner of meditation. I'll explain. Animals like cows and elk, they do something that is called chew the cud. And that is where they slowly chew their partially digested food over and over again in their mouth before they finally go to the process of swallowing it. And I think we need to be more like that when it comes to meditating on the Word of God, where we swallow in all to regurgitate some, to derive future benefit from it throughout the day. So according to Psalm 1, we must come to the Word of God with both with delight and with meditation, and, we, and not, just, not just so that we can increase in our knowledge and our minds, but so that we can feed our soul and ultimately change the direction of our life so that God can be most glorified. And the person who does this, it says, is like a tree. We may not think of a tree as a most endearing term, but I think it's a very fitting illustration. In the same way that a tree is served by streams of water, the Christian life is served by streams of God's word. In the same way that a tree manifests its foliage and its leaves and its fruit, the Christian man reveals his life by the fruit of his deeds as well. And the text says something that I think is, is interesting. It uses the word in season. What do you suppose that means? I, I asked that same question. I learned that there are a number of interpretations for what that means, and I will simply tell you where I fall on this. When it says you will produce fruit in season, I think it's saying that there 
are various seasons that we go through in life as Christians. And depending on the season that we find ourselves in, we will yield the appropriate fruit. For example, in the hour of temptation, the fruit of integrity and purity will be produced in the believer's life. In times of suffering, the fruit of patience will be made manifest in their life. In times of great prosperity, the fruit of godly joy and generosity and thanksgiving will be revealed. And this blessing that we're given, it comes also with a promise. And the promise is that our leaves will not wither. See, the Lord's trees are like the Oregon evergreens. It, it doesn't matter how cold the winter is, it still won't destroy them. And yet, unlike the evergreens, they're fruit-producing trees. So outside influences don't destroy them, and they always bear fruit because they're connected to the stream of God's word. And this picture is what a righteous man looks like. In one sense, he avoids and he also embraces. He, he puts off, but he also puts on. He doesn't isolate his life. He insulates it with the everlasting word of the Lord. We now brought our attention to the second type of person, that is in verse 4 and 5, and that is the sinful man. We've seen the righteous man, and now we see the sinful man. Verse 4, the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. You see, the wicked are devoid of roots below and fruits above. I, uh, I see here in this that the reality that we, there are real consequences to decisions that we make. Very real consequences. I, like many of you know, I work as a police officer, and throughout the years, I can tell you so many occasions where I have talked to people who are literally in the furnace of affliction and they've made comments to me, their same comments, usually out of despair, usually out of total confusion, but they'll say something to the effect of, how did this happen to me? How did I get here? How did this happen? And what's so sad to me about that question is the answer most of the time is the same, that they're simply harvesting the seeds that they planted and so whether in life or in marriage or relationship or at work, the reality is, the reality of Psalm 1 is that we will harvest the seeds that we plant. And you look at marriages at times that, that, that you've, you've planted seeds for years and years of discourse, of, of distrust, of discouragement. And then you look back and you wonder, how did this happen? And the truth is, you're harvesting what you've planted your whole life. And the, and the truth that we see here is that we cannot go through life and think we own the things that actually belong to God. If this past week has not revealed that, I don't know what will. We cannot go through life and live in opposition to God's word and expect a favorable outcome. And one of the most powerful lies the enemy is telling us is that we don't need to, to believe that what we do will make any difference. It will make a difference. According to Psalms 1, it does make a difference. And of this whole passage, this was the part I struggled with the most because the truth is, I don't always act like my words and behavior always bear consequence. But the truth is, they do. And Psalm 1 draws this out of us. And Psalm 1 teaches that for those who are wicked, for those who deny the Lord, who reject his lordship, it teaches that you cannot doubt God's existence and functionally repudiate his standards and expect a favorable outcome at the end of your life. There will be consequences. And we're given this, this frightening illustration of winnowing the shaft. This is the process whereby grain is thrown up in the air and the wind blows away the shaft and the heavier straw falls to the ground. The shaft is blown away and the, the grain falls to the ground. This is really a picture of God's judgment. And it's a picture that we are completely powerless against it. And it is a, a scary thought to consider. All of our lives' investments could be treated like the shaft, simply blown away. And I just want to challenge you this morning. How much of your life is invested in the things of God? How much of your day is truly invested in the Lord? How much of your week, how much of the past year is invested in the things of God? And I want you to remember this picture 
because God will blow away the shaft. The things that are not committed to him are not of value. And sometimes we value more than we should things that have nothing to do with honoring the Lord. Beloved, I think this is exactly why persecution is actually good for the church. Any sort of cursory reading of church history will tell you that the church has always flourished in times of persecution. The reason is because it winnows out the grain. It exposes the shaft. And because I think it's especially important in, in this day and age, especially in our Western American consumer-minded culture, that the tars grow in the same furrows as the wheat. Charles Spurgeon said that God's precious diamonds are in the same field as the pebbles. But what we see in Psalm 1 is that God will separate the two. It, it will not always be that way. And the lesson of Psalm 1 is that we are called to be trees with roots that are functionally sunk deep into the water of his grace and his wisdom and his love. And we are to avoid the dangers of living as if we are somehow in and of ourselves capable of writing our own laws and inventing our own truth and depending upon our own strength. And to remember that if I try to do that, that I will be just like the shaft that is blown away into the judgment of God. We now come to verse 6. We've seen the righteous man, we've seen the sinful man. In verse 6, we see the judge of man. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Verse 6 really is alarming, but I don't think it's confusing at all. You don't need a seminary degree to understand what verse 6 is saying. It's, it's not difficult to interpret. It's plain. It's clear. God is the judge. He knows and sees the true status of the heart. And he will judge rightly in the final verdict. And so we might look and say, so why then is this important? And there is a number of reasons, but I want to draw your attention to two. One, because you and I live in the midst of this. And daily, we must be aware of its perspectives upon our lives and ask if ourselves, are, are there areas that we have allowed the counsel and the influence of others to move us toward the direction of the shaft and realize that if those areas do exist inside of our lives, then we must also realize that Psalm 1 calls us back calls us back to establish our roots in the wisdom of the Lord and the bounty of his grace. And secondly, we realize that we have work to do. As the church, we have work to do. That the greatest need of 2020 is not to survive COVID-19. The greatest need is not to stock our basements with food and water and generators and toilet paper. The greatest need of 2020 is to stock our hearts with the word of God and to start, stock our hearts with the gospel of Christ and that this culture needs bold Christians who will tell them the truth about God. And this community, what it needs most is truth tellers Christians who are unashamed to bring the truth of the gospel to them, who are unashamed to look them in the eyes and say that there is a right way to live and a wrong way to live. And that according to scripture, there is a God who will judge and the judge isn't you. You are not autonomous. You are accountable to him. And it is of no benefit for us as Christians to know that and not say that. It is not kindness for me to, to watch my neighbor's house burn down and, and do nothing but stand at a safe distance and, and throw up a casual prayer. No, it is kindness. What kindness is, is to not only, yes, fervently pray for them, but to pick up the phone and call them. And if he doesn't answer the phone, then I go to his house and I knock on his door. And if he doesn't answer the door, then I'm prepared to kick the door down and drag him out because that's what Christian love does. The, the tolerance world would tell you the best thing you can do is that as he breathes his last breath, that he just remembers you as being a really nice guy. But that is not love. And that is not the message of Christianity. And we don't want to be deceived in thinking that that's how we love the world. We tell the world the truth. And we might say, well, they didn't ask for my help. Well, church, you didn't ask for God's help either. But somebody told you about it. Somebody told me about it, and I'm so grateful. 
Yeah, throughout my life, people, it's like they put stones in my shoe. Scriptures led me to Christ, by which I was saved. And the same is true with you. And we have been commissioned to, to do this work, to share the gospel. And this community is big, I realize, and this church, by comparison, is small. But, friends, don't forget that God has always worked through a smaller remnant. It has always been that way. God loves to take what is seemingly small and weak and insignificant in the world's eyes and make it a trophy of his grace. Don't forget that even in the book of Judges, God rebuked Gideon because his army was too big. God didn't want to use 22,000 men. God only wanted to use 300. But you know why? Because God gets more glory when the odds are against him. And so we do not need to be fearful to engage the culture so long as our life is insulated with his word and it is embedded inside of our hearts and minds. And culture is most profoundly changed, not through huge institutions or political policies or extravagant ministries. That's why mostly pragmatism in the church has always failed. It's, it's most changed when ordinary individuals' feet hit the sidewalks and they engage the culture with a heart that is familiar with the word of God, that has embraced the word of God, and they share the gospel of truth in the lives where God has placed them. And this community, what it needs is people who believe this psalm, that there is a moral world, that there is truth and there is falsehood, that there is a God of righteousness and of love, and that, that everyone is marching to one of two destinies, either heaven or hell, and that those two places are real, as real as the couch or chair you're sitting on, and that there are consequences to our choices and to our beliefs, and that it's not okay to repudiate everything for which God created you to live for. And it should shock and sadden us that there are people all around us who we are directly accessible to and who are living without the hope of Christ. And this psalm should motivate us to reach them with the objective truth of the gospel that Jesus Christ came to save sinners such as us. And I do, I realize that this is a big task. And I realize that we cannot do everything but I also know we can all do something. And the things that we can do, we will do. And the things that we will do, we must do in order to introduce those who are at danger of perishing to the wisdom of the Lord, to the righteousness of Christ, and to the comfort that comes through knowing what it means to have a relationship with him through forgiveness and through his grace. Beloved, the church needs to know that the truth matters. The world needs to know the truth matters, especially when you're on the receiving end of a lie. And I pray that the Lord would grant each of us the ability to speak that truth to those who are perishing so that Christ would receive all the glory for which he came and died. Let's pray. Father, I, I am so grateful for your word. I'm grateful for the Psalms. I'm grateful for the whole counsel of your word. And Lord, I just pray that tonight that we would be eager to share your word with the world around us. I pray that we would be moved to, to be bold to be truth tellers, that we would recognize the areas inside of our own lives where we have maybe compromised, where we have allowed the, the influence of others of the world to, to cause us to be fearful, to cause us to hesitate, to cause us to maybe think twice. Lord, make us so bold as to just share the truth. Make us love with a true Christian love where we don't hold back what one needs to hear. And that we do so in such a way that is winsome. And Lord, I, I, I want to bring you honor. I want this church to bring you honor. I want each of our lives to bring you honor. I pray that you would help us do just that. Lord, we have the greatest message in the world. And we've experienced the greatest love in the world. And I, my heart hurts for those who do not know that. May they know it, God. And may you call them by your grace. May you win them to the Lord. 
forever. Lord, may they be found secure in you, and may you get all the glory before you deserve it. Thank you. We praise you. In the Lord Jesus' name we ask. Amen.